Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Martin, owner and vintner of Oceano Wines. We specialize in Chardonnay and Pinot Noir grown at SIP certified Spanish Springs Vineyard in the central coast of California in the newly proposed San Luis Obispo Coast AVA. Our guest today is program director for the vineyard team of SIP certified Beth Vuk. Vukmanic. Is that right, Beth? Vukmanic. Yes, it's, it's a tough one. <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, and uh, so, Beth, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really excited to share with everybody what is SIP certification and why sustainability matters. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, the SIP program? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So SIP certified is a sustainable certification for wine growers and sustainability is about being more than green. So we're meeting today's needs without preventing the future from meeting theirs. And we like to talk about the three P's, which is people, planet, and prosperity. Awesome. I love that because um, putting people in the equation is what I think makes um, SIP so special because of course it's very important to look after the planet, um, but it's also equally as important to consider the people. Um, and so when you say people, can you explain the parameters for that? Yes, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that our people are our most valuable resource. And we talk about sustainability a lot of the times, the assumption is that we're just looking at environmental issues, but the people are a huge part of any work that's getting done. So within the SIP certified program, we're looking at providing competitive wages, medical insurance. There's a lot of training and education. So it's not just teaching somebody how to do their job, but really incorporating them into the organization itself. You know, we all feel more engaged with the work that we're doing when we're constantly learning and have an opportunity to grow within our place. And so that's a big, big component. And you'll find with a lot of our members, they've had employees that have been with them for years, you know, oftentimes even decades. And that's a real testament to that sort of involvement. And beyond, you know, the people who are there doing the work and making this great wine, we're also <laughs> looking at being a part of the community. So especially in the end of Valley where you're sourcing your incredible grapes from, that's an area that's a wonderful mix of both neighborhoods and farming operations. So the farming operations themselves have this opportunity to talk with their neighbors and teach them about, you know, what it means to farm grapes or any kind of a crop as they're engaging with them and, and being a part of the community that way. And then of course, lots of other wonderful work that they do, whether it be donations to scholarship funds or donating wine to different causes. Um, there's tons and tons of great volunteer events that you hear all of our members participating in. Yeah, well, I'm so proud. Of I'm getting a little feedback, do you hear that? I don't no. hear it. Okay. Well, I'm really proud to carry the SIP certification uh, symbol on our website and on our wines. Um, we source from Spanish Springs Vineyard, which is actually just west of the Edna Valley. So mm -hmm. it's in Price Canyon and it's in that newly uh, to be established AVA San Luis Obispo coast, which is also um, nearer to Cal Poly. Mm -hmm. And Cal Poly is a school that that is um, quite recognized and uh, pretty difficult to get into as well. And I know that you're a graduate of um, Cal Poly. Is that how you came to the San Luis Obispo area and then discovered SIP certified? Yes, exactly. So I came here to go to college and I'm fortunate that I was able to stay as many people aspire to do, I believe. So I got a degree in agricultural business and a minor in music as I was going through college there. And my first couple of years out of school, I actually didn't work in agriculture. I worked for a who builds these for the PGA and different country clubs, which was a really fun experience to do. But after a couple of years, I really wanted to, you know, kind of get back to that degree that I spent time, <laughs> you know, and money. money. Yeah, <laughs> you're getting. So, I feel so fortunate that this position with the vineyard team was opening up. This was in 2009. 
And the SIP certified program at that time, the vineyard portion of it had just launched in 2008. So it was the second year of the program. And I've you know, been with them ever since. And it's been an incredible ride just to be able to see the program grow from, I think it was maybe 9,000 acres then. And now we're about 42,000 acres. We started out primarily in the Central Coast. That's where we do a lot of our education through our nonprofit parent, which is the vineyard team. But now we're all throughout the state of California, and we actually have a couple of vineyards certified out in Michigan as well now. Wow. Well, um, tell me a little bit more about the, the vineyard aspect and how SIP is different from other sustainability, uh, sustainable certifications, and also how it's different from organic certification. Great questions. So the vineyard team that I mentioned before, which is our, our nonprofit parent that developed SIP certified, was established in 94 on the central coast of California. And our roots are really in education. It was a bunch of farmers who wanted to get together and learn how to do a better job and talk about resource issues, whether it be pest management or irrigation efficiency or how to train their employees. And so in 96, we wrote the first self-assessment for sustainable vineyard farming. And it was this thousand point questionnaire that covers everything from uh, establishing a conservation plan for your natural habitat, irrigation efficiency, water conservation, recycling, you know, all the way into business practices. This is the holistic approach of sustainability, the, the three P's, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd have people come in, do the self-assessment, and we'd recommend that they maybe find some practices that they weren't doing and consider implementing them the following year. We'd have them take the self-assessment again with the goal to see if they could improve their scores and what we found is that this really worked as a learning tool. So people were improving their scores over time. So in the early 2000s, we had our grower community come back to us and they said, there's a lot of green claims in the marketplace. I'm sure a lot of people can remember this is when organics was becoming really popular. And you're seeing, you know, things like all natural on packaging. And their thought was, you know, if we're going to say we're making wine sustainably, we want a rigorous certification that's third party audited to validate that claim. And so we took that self-assessment and turned it into what's now SIP certified for the, the vineyards in 2008. So all of those practices are very specific and measurable. Something like you need to have a winter cover crop. That's something that an inspector could go out on site and verify has been done. And so on the consumer side, when you see that SIP certified logo on a label or on any kind of packaging, they can know that it's been made with care for both the people and the planet. And your other question was about uh, sustainable. Like how, and, how it's different from organic certification. Yeah. Yes. And that's a really, really good question. So there's definitely overlap in the programs. And we have people who are certified under both. So they both look at farm management, soil conservation. But the neat thing about sustainability is we're looking at, again, that holistic view. So everything else. So that's where we get into packaging, recycling, air quality, energy efficiency, business sustainability, marketing, human resource issues. So it's a big picture approach. And within sustainability, you know, people are pulling from a lot of different, you know, types of farming to come up with the best, you know, most sustainable <laughs> approach for their property. <laughs> yeah, well, um, so it's really, it's great for the planet, the people, and it's also great for the consumer because it's hard to, when you're shopping for wine or um, when you're when you're thinking about where your food source comes from, it's great to have a program that you feel like really um, that you can digest and understand because we throw the term sustainable around all the time, but we don't really know the definition for what that means. Yes. So, yeah, I find that really can be a confusing point for the for the consumer so I'm, I'm SIP certified is great about that but how do we get SIP certified out and and understood by more people I think just by talking about it and that's been one of our our big focuses over the last couple of years is actually helping our members in every department you know because traditionally we're working with either the viticulturalist or the winemaker but we've been providing more and more educational tools for tasting room staff, for sales teams, for marketing teams to help them convey sustainability. Because I agree with you, it can be confusing for consumers, but that's an opportunity. 
And people are usually very interested and receptive to sustainability. You know, who doesn't want to support a good practice? <laughs> so it's right, a nice right. thing to talk about. And then especially for anybody when they're talking to a consumer, whether they be a distributor or in a tasting room, it gives you so many things to talk about. I mean, from owl boxes to how you can conserve water to how you're taking care of your employees, there's a lot of great conversation starters that all tie back into sustainable practices. Yeah, let's talk about that. So let's talk about, say, unwanted pests in the vineyard. What, what, how would you handle that if you're a SIP certified vineyard? Well, within sustainability, a big thing is IPM or integrated pest management. And that type of, of farming practice has been around for, I believe, over 50 years. And it's really about looking at all of the tools that you have to manage a pest. So that could be something like pulling leaves. You know, if you have mildew issues, that allows more airflow to come through. It could be something like those cover crops that we mentioned before, all the grasses that grow in between the vine rows. It would be adding some flower mixes in there that could attract a beneficial insect. You'll hear about people even releasing beneficials to deal with pest issues. Owls are great gopher getters. So those cute little barn owls that will live on the mm -hmm. property are good for that as well. So there's a number of different ways that you can manage pest issues. It's about incorporating different tools. And we have a really great uh, person on our board named Paul Kraut, and he always talks about how it's really a decision tree, you know, when you're figuring out how to deal with a pest, because sometimes the first answer is you don't have to do anything, you know, if like the damage isn't bad. Um, but then, you know, you have to pay attention to it. It becomes like a watch spot. It's like if you have a leak under your sink, you know, if you catch it right away, then then you can solve that problem pretty quickly and easily. Whereas if you like don't know, <laughs> you could flood out your kitchen. <laughs> you know, I, I find it interesting um, when it comes to like going out for a meal, going to dinner, you go to a farm to table restaurant or a restaurant that claims to source sustainably, but then the wine list doesn't reflect uh, that, you know, that oath to, to sustainability. So how, how, how do we, as I guess, what would you recommend as wine producers, how to go about that problem? I think saying just that, you know, because farm to table is so popular and it's a great experience. I love going out to eat locally and knowing that the produce came from a farm right down the road. That's a nice dining experience. And I think just asking the question of, you know, have you considered, you know, aligning your your beverage list or your wine list with the values that you clearly care about in your food so that they can have something that's local and sustainably made too. It's a great additional selling point about your wine. You know, you already have a great story. You have a good quality. Um, you know, you're in alignment with that restaurant. And this is another component that really adds to that. Yeah, I think it'd be really great to have a on the wine list, like sustainable wines or organic wines or vegan wines, because our wines are certified as vegan. Um, so, but vegan restaurants, typically they don't, sorry to call anyone out or maybe I'm wrong or whatever, but they don't typically hold to the same standards when it comes to the wine list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wonder if that's maybe just an, an educational point too for restaurants as well. Maybe they don't know that it's available. You know, they might not know that this really is an option for them, that they could build a wine list that's sustainable and vegan and have that as an option to match, you know, the rest of what they're delivering. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And it means, you know, I, I'm one of those people who really cares about where everything comes from. So, you know, I'd like for, you know, other people to care so much as well. Can you tell me a little bit about the special region of San Luis Obispo and the wineries there, the vineyards there, maybe how many of the local wineries and vineyards are SIP certified? Yes, I haven't run the numbers lately, but the Edna Valley has the highest percentage of SIP certified vineyards out of all of the, you know, kind of like wine regions that are involved within our program. Uh, I personally live in the area and I love wine tasting in San Luis Obispo. It's beautiful. The Edna Valley is really easy to get around. There's tons and tons of wonderful wineries to go to. And then you can just pop right downtown and have a lovely meal. It's it's a great location for wine tasting. I love it there. Um, I go often uh, during the growing season. 
Um, mm -hmm. As some people may or may not know, I'm based in New York City. And so I like to say I commute to California for work. <laughs> and uh, we, um, I love the area as well. The food's amazing. And um, my favorite, honestly, my favorite part is how it, it's, I wouldn't call it exactly rustic, but it's more unspoiled. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of hiking trails. And is that something that you, um, you know, do in your spare time when you're there? You know, what, it, what, what is your pastime besides vineyards? Yes. Oh, yeah. I love that. That's a that's a great thing about the San Luis Obispo area. There's so much to do. I mean, you're 15 minutes from the beach. You can go wine tasting. There's tons of wonderful hiking trails. That's a great thing to talk about. We have wonderful dining experiences here. There's so much to do. You could easily fill, you know, like a whole vacation out here. <laughs> and, and keep coming back to experience new things. I mean, I, it, it's really remarkable. I highly recommend anyone to go and, and visit. Um, just wanted to show, so this is what I'm drinking. This is our Chardonnay. I didn't want anyone to think that maybe I was um, drinking um, a wine from outside of the region, but um, I would say that the area of San Luis Obispo um, coast, where we are in parts of the Edna Valley, really uh, bent the the grapes, the best grapes grown are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir um, that really show the terroir and the style of wine that's that's possible, the quality of wine that's possible in the area. Um, do you have any favorite wines or vineyards? You know, I'm not gonna ask you to say Oceana wines, yeah. but you know, tell us a little bit about what, what do you like to drink and um, what vineyards do you uh, prefer to visit that are SIP certified? Oh man, there's always so many and I feel like I'm always doing a bit of a rotation to go through them all. Uh, Shamazal's really fun to go to. They have that incredible airstream out there. That's a really- I know, cool I'm place. serious. Like I'm so jealous of that airstream. I want it immediately. Oh, yeah, it's great. Like that's just a fun atmosphere. So I love going out there. They also have a SIP certified winery, which is cool too. So that's a fun component to learn about. So that looks at the wine processing facility. Mm -hmm. Where else is really fun? You know, Beliana is fun. They have the bocce ball court out there and a bunch of like kind of green space. So it's nice if you want to go out and kind of do a picnic game event. Center of Effort is a phenomenal spot to go to. It's a beautiful facility, um, especially like the, the indoor section. They have this really cool kitchen set up that would be fun to do like a cooking, like a cooking and wine event would be really fun in there. There's so many places to go. <laughs> Yeah, there are so many places. When I'm there, I really, you know, I spend most of my time at, at the vineyard, um, but I like to go out to eat. Some of the restaurants like Spoon Trade in Ember are some of my favorites. Yes, those are great. There's a really funky little Thai place down there called Thai Divine in Grover Beach. I don't know if you've been there or not. It's great. I haven't. Oh, it's okay. so good. It's like the food that you get in Thailand. It's excellent. So are things open back up in slow? Yeah, I went out actually last night downtown in San Luis Obispo and things are pretty well open. I was actually surprised at how busy it was for a Monday night. <laughs> there was it, The restaurants were full. You know, I mean, they're at, I think we're at 50% capacity indoors now or 25. I can't remember offhand. So they were, you know, as full as they, as they can be. But one of the nice things, I guess, in a way that sort of came out of this was people were able to expand their dining into outdoor spaces. So there's a lot of expanded out kind of onto the sidewalk or they built out their you know patio areas that were behind the restaurants that might not have been utilized before. So there's some great outdoor dining experiences, especially as we get into summer where the weather here is just so wonderful. It's it's really nice. Yeah, well, I you know, obviously in New York City the same thing happened and there's a lot more outdoor dining than there ever has been. So it's kind of a, a positive takeaway from a really you know tough experience and, and difficulty in the industry but i know that it the wineries were really hit hard when the tasting rooms were closed and so i'm happy to hear that everything's back up and running we don't have a tasting room in san luis obispo we do make our wines in napa and so that's a little bit of the rub and i'm based in new york city so we haven't you know it's a little bit tough to get all these things together when you're when you're distant, um, yeah. but we are looking forward to a mobile tasting room um, next year, January next year, we'll have delivered. 
and an Airstream maybe was a little bit, you know, a little bit high priced um, for us. We're a very small production winery. We produce about 1,000 cases yearly, and we spe specialize only in Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and we make them at a premium level only too. So not a lot of wine, um, but we will be uh, purchasing a vintage VW bus, oh, which cute. is very cool. And um, it's sourced from uh, Mexico mm -hmm. and it's being built out in Mexico City to be, a, to be a tasting room and have sinks and refrigerators. So we'll be taking that um, around first, you know, around the Hamptons in the New York City area. And as we establish that eventually, we'll have one in slow as well. What a blast. That's a great idea. That'll be fun. <laughs> it embodies like that California lifestyle, mm -hmm. like kind of like a traveler, boho chic type of thing. I, I grew up in Southern California. So uh, mm -hmm. close to the beach, um, right outside of Huntington Beach. And so I absolutely like always want to go back. I have that wanderlust. Yeah. And I, I think that's how I ended up becoming a California wine producer after spending time uh, in Virginia running my family's winery and vineyard there, Boxwood Winery. I've just always wanted to have, you know, some type of uh, you know, a foot in, in California, um, because I just, I'm a bi-coastal, I'm bi-coastal, yes. you know, and that's the embodiment of our wine too. We like to call it coastal by nature. And the, uh, Spanish Springs Vineyard is right, uh, east of the Pismo Reserve. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very rustic, unspoiled area. It's so awesome. So when, what do you think, uh, what is the future for SIP certified? And can you tell me, I know you have a podcast. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, you know, with SIP certified, like I mentioned earlier, we're really working right now on helping our members incorporate sustainability into their own messaging and marketing. And so that's been a, a big push for us. So we have a great newsletter for that where we give people these actionable tips, whether it be how to discuss sustainability on social media or how to film, you know, quick and easy videos without having like a production team, something that you could do on your iPhone to really communicate the good work that you're doing. So that's a, a wonderful piece that we're going to keep working on always. And within the program itself, it's always being improved and updated with science and technology. It's considered a living document. So we have a technical committee that updates it every year. We have it externally peer reviewed by experts, whether that be, you know, someone from the Environmental Protection Agency or UC Davis or Cornell. So we're always improving what sustainability looks like because that's always going to, you know, level up. And then our podcast, if yeah, you I want to hear about yeah. that. Is, is it you that uh, leads the podcast? I do. I lead the podcast, although I'm not the interviewer. I'm like the behind the scenes. I guess you could call me the producer of it <laughs> if you wanted to give it a title. Yes, but the, the podcast is my little uh, pet project. I love podcasts of all sorts. And so a few years ago, yeah, I love them. I was, I was just thinking, you know, people spend a lot of time working out in the vineyard or maybe if they manage a few, they might be commuting from one place to the other. And what a good way to learn about science and technology in viticulture than listening to it. And podcasts are such a great, readily available free resource. So we launched what's called the Sustainable Wine Growing Podcast. Uh, appropriately enough. And we get to interview people from all over the globe. So it can be researchers or farmers about the work that they're doing. So we've done them on, you know, there's a really good one on barn owls talking about research on that. We did one on sheep grazing recently. We have one on subsurface irrigation done with PVC pipe which can reduce water use by like 30% is what they're finding. So yeah, so it's just incredible, you know, the amount of information and research that's out there and it gives people anywhere in the world access to this information. And how do we find it? So if you just, any podcast player that you're using, you know, whether it's on your iPhone, you know, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, we're on all of them and just look up sustainable wine growing. Or if you go to vineyardteam.org, we'll have a section there for our podcast too. And that will have all of the episodes listen to it. So it's a, it's a little bit confusing. Um, so you have vineyardteam.org mm -hmm. and sipcertified.org. What do you yes. find on either website? 
Yes. So Vineyard Team is the parent company. So if you were to go to vineyardteam.org, then you would be able to find the podcast, Sustainable Wine Growing Podcast, any of our educational events. Um, We have a ton of resources on there if you're looking for information on anything to do with sustainable wine growing. It it will also link to SIP Certified, though, from there. Or you could go directly to sipcertified.org, and that will be all information about SIP. So that's where you can meet all of our members. We have great profiles on them. You can learn what the standards are, the rules to get certified, learn the process about getting certified. So that's all on sipcertified.org. Got it. Well, I'll have to get my profile up on there. Yeah. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then also I'm going to tune into the podcast. I'm always interested in learning and I know that things change and uh, new trends happen, new discoveries. And that's what, um, that's what life is all about, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's, you know, the foundation of our organization is education and learning and improvement. And we're really fortunate to be in an area and working with a group of farmers who are really big proponents of that. You know, it's very progressive to be talking about sustainability in 94. And it's something that they still care about today. You know, our founding members, a lot of them still have at their organizations, people on our board. So we're on third and fourth generation, you know, board members over 25 years later, which is phenomenal. That's incredible. The, the, the community is amazing. And how long have you been the program director? I've been here since 2009. So I guess 12 years. And how do people, I guess, reach out if they want to learn more about SIP? Oh, yeah. You, you could definitely shoot me an email. It's beth at sipcertified.org. Or if you just want to, you know, poke around at sipcertified.org, the website is a great place to get information about the program and all of our members and the wines that are being made sustainably. That's awesome. Beth, thank you for coming on Tasting Room Live. It's uh, wonderful to see you. And um, thanks for providing all of that great information about sustainability. Um, You know, it's core value of ours. And um, thanks for the work that you do. Yeah, thank you. And we appreciate your work too. It's it's people like you that support sustainability in a big way. Yeah, right. And I mean, wine, you, like, come on, you can't live without it. It's just like food. So, yeah, you know, necessity. what we're trying to do is provide joy. And mm-hmm. uh, so, so mm-hmm. thanks for everything. And thank you for joining us. If you continue to comment um, on the video, we'll answer your questions in the comments or you can uh, email Beth directly. So thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you.